Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Heritage Church. We're so glad you're here. Grateful for the opportunity to come and worship, to lift high the name of Jesus Christ. And if you're a guest with us this morning, we trust and hope that you'll be blessed as we worship our God together in this place. That worship is something God calls us to do each Sunday and each day and invites you to stand as we have a responsive call to worship this morning from Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises. Join me as we do this this morning, beginning with the opening song of worship. Praise the Lord. Sing hallelujah. <clears throat> To this one whose glory is exalted far above the earth and sky, he greets us and welcomes us as a father in heaven who loves his children. Receive his greeting this morning. Grace to you and peace from God who is our loving father in heaven and in Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior of all. And together, God's people say, amen. And we continue our worship this morning beginning with the song, You Are My All 
in all. It is a joy in the Christian life. You know, we, we are called to worship every day, but on Sunday mornings we get to do this together and with one voice declare the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his most glorious light. Another way that we express our faith is in unison professing that faith. So this morning we're going to do that as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to join me as we profess these words together in unison. Together we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It is a gift, it truly is, not only here on Sunday mornings, but each day to claim together what it is we believe. We do so before a holy God, and uh, the same God who is holy invites us into his presence, and we spend some time on Sundays in prayer. We're going to do that again this morning. Just two uh, quick updates, uh, an update regarding, uh, in regard to Marilyn Stremler. Uh, Marilyn did transfer. She had her stroke two weeks ago today. She transferred on Friday to Mary Freebed uh, for rehab. And uh, she and, and will do the work there, and Farrell will be going back and forth uh, to Grand Rapids to see her. And thank you to any of you and all of you who are helping with that transportation as well, but we'll continue to keep Marilyn uh, in our prayers. And then just an update, uh, this past week you received an uh, email prayer request for Donnie Waterhouse due to some concerns with an EKG test. Uh, further testing showed there were no significant major concerns for sure, and we're thankful to God for that. So we continue to pray for uh, Donnie as well. Let's, uh, let's do that. Let's go to our God in prayer this morning. Please join me. Almighty and loving Father in heaven, here on this beautiful morning, gathered as the body of Christ in this place, we rejoice we rejoice in the depths of your mercy and grace toward us. We thank you, Father, that this is our story. That we were lost, but now we are found. We were blind, but now we see. We were dead in our sin. And out of sheer grace, you made us alive in Jesus Christ. So, Father, in the joy of this truth, help our worship again this morning to rise to the occasion as we stand in awe of you. All this being true, we also come, Father, in, in repentance. We confess, O oh God, that too often we, we do not see you for all the distractions that fill our lives. The sin that, that so easily entangles us, trips us up. Envy, greed, slander, and such as these. Forgive us, O oh Lord. And by your mercy in Jesus and in the promise of what can be, Lord, we May we take up daily the cross of Christ. May we wholeheartedly be willing and ready from now on to live for him. Father, we thank you for, for summer. We thank you for the warmth of the sun and, and increased daylight. We thank you for freedom, both as citizens of this land and even more as citizens of your kingdom. We thank you today for wedding days and wedding anniversaries, for friendships, and the gift of belonging to a community of believers. We thank you for the strength we need to care for one another and the gift of being cared for. Teach us. Teach us, O oh God, how we can pray no matter where we are and what we are doing. Teach us to worship you from the rising of the sun to its setting again. Grow in us the capacity to love the unlovable and forgive the unforgivable. Forgivable. And in that way, fulfilling the words of Jesus when he taught us to pray that your kingdom may come and your will be done. Lord, we pray this morning for this faith community. We ask for continued strength and healing for Marilyn. May her time at Mary Freebed be beneficial toward her recovery from a stroke. Lord, we continue to pray for Donnie and ask that you would grant her daily strength as well. We pray for our homebound members. Lord, may they grow in faith and hope and love each day with all of us together. And we pray for Jim Bosch as he left yesterday for a week of mission trip in Rehoboth and pray that it would be a week of, of fruitful ministry and opportunities to let the light of Jesus shine uh, into that community. Lord, we pray this morning for this city. We, we know there are too many, too many children going hungry. There are others without a bed to sleep in at night and still more who are crushed by addictions. As we are able, and we are able, 
Help us to be generous in giving our time and talents and treasures so that, well, again, that your light may shine in the darkness. Finally, we pray this morning for those who have not yet put their trust in you, Jesus. You who are the way and the truth and the life and how, how no one gets to the Father apart from you. And so we pray today, Holy Spirit, that you would revive the hearts of those who are far off. Help them to discover the treasure of eternal life in Christ. To you, O God, belongs all the praise and glory and honor. To you we lift up these prayers, for you alone are worthy. And in Jesus, you welcome us. You hear us when we pray. And so it is in his name we ask all of this. Amen. Just a couple quick announcements, and then we'll have the opportunity to open God's Word this morning. A reminder for the members of this congregation, we have a congregational meeting planned for after the service. Go and have some time of community and fellowship, of course. And and yes, I will bellow and uh, make your way back in here to the sanctuary. We have a congregational meeting this morning on um, a proposal to replace the roof on this facility, which is uh, almost 20 years old now. So join us after the service for that congregational meeting and that, uh, that discussion as well. And then uh, just a second announcement about our offering this morning. Uh, we have very grateful to our deacons who oversee the, the schedule for our offerings. And I mention this every Sunday. We invest ourselves in what is beyond us, right, beyond this ministry, which is so vital and important. And one of the ways we do that and one of the ways we bless our deacons to do that is through what we call a benevolent fund. And uh, this morning as you leave and pre present your offerings and the baskets at the doors, the loose change, all the, all the uh, uh, money that's put in there, loose change, why it will go toward the benevolence fund, which is a ministry uh, of caring and a ministry of support for those in need. And uh, we trust that you'll give generously uh, toward that as well. Uh, there's no heritage happenings this week. Uh, Lisa Bosch is on vacation this past week, but I trust uh, she'll arrive safely back home again and be back in the office this week. So one will be there uh, for you next Sunday. Well, now we have the opportunity to open God's Word together. And I invite you to turn in a Bible with me to Psalm 49. Psalm 49 this morning. We are in a summer in the Psalms. And I was reflecting on this this morning and uh, probably because my wife's been uh, on, in Ontario for the past week and a half caring for her mother, but it feels like my summer is just flying by. And, uh, or I, I could just be honest, I miss her like crazy. So, um, but the summer flies by, but in the midst of it here, we are pausing and spending some time in the Psalms once again. And this morning it is Psalm 49. Jesus often says in his parables to those who have ears to hear, and sometimes he includes eyes to see. And if you spend any time in Scripture, and this is very much uh, about what our psalm is this morning, if you spend any time in Scripture, there's really two main things that Scripture will teach us. It'll teach us that our greatest need is only something God can provide. We can't earn it. And that's the grace and the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. We, we need it, but we can't earn it. And, and the second thing, and this is the broad sort of view of Scripture, the second thing is if we have received this gift, to those who have received what we do not deserve, what does it mean to live in the joy of that salvation? Well, Psalm 49, we see that both of these truths are at work. What does it mean to earn something that we could not purchase ourselves and what does it mean to live in the reality of that very truth? And in particular, Psalm 49 uh, meets us this morning and it tells us, well, it, it tells us what we know. And that is that every day we're tempted. Every day we're tempted to put our trust, our eternal security, even at times, but our security in earthly treasures. Rather than when Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, not to store up earthly treasures, but heavenly ones, which ultimately um, is him. But every day we're tempted to do this. We put our security in things that do not last. And so how do we navigate this well as followers of Jesus Christ? How do we navigate this world we live in that's filled with stuff, much of it that's good, but also has an impact on our, on our hearts? Well, Psalm 49 is, is God's answer to that as well. 
Before we open God's word, though, join me once again in prayer as we ask for the Spirit's blessing. Please join me. Father in heaven, you have done a great work in Jesus. You have given us what we could not earn. Now we pray that as we, we open your book, this book, this word that comes from you, that you would write it and print it upon our hearts, we know how best to live for you, especially when it comes to our stuff. Do this, O oh God, through the power of your Spirit in this place. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand. We honor God's Word each Sunday morning by doing this together, as has often been the custom all the way back within the Jewish community. They would stand for the reading of God's Word. And uh, this morning we listened to Psalm 49. Follow along as we hear God's Word this morning. Hear this, all you peoples. Listen, all who live in this world, both low and high, rich and poor alike. My mouth will speak words of wisdom. The utterance from my heart will give understanding. I will turn my ear to a proverb. With the harp, I will expound my riddle. Why should I fear when evil days come, when wicked deceivers surround me, those who trust in their wealth and boast of their great riches? No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay. For all can see that wise men die. The foolish and the senseless alike perish and leave their wealth to others. Their tombs will remain their houses forever, their dwellings for endless generations, though they had named lands after themselves. But man, despite his riches, does not endure. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the fate of those who trust in themselves and of their followers who approve their sayings. Like sheep, they are destined for the grave, and death will feed on them. The upright will rule over them in the morning. Their forms will decay in the grave far from their princely mansions. But God will redeem my life from the grave. He will surely take me to himself. Do not be overwhelmed when a man grows rich, when the splendor of his house increases, for he will take nothing with him when he dies. His splendor will not descend with him. Though while he lived, he counted himself blessed, and men praise you when you prosper, he will join the generation of his fathers who will never see the light of life. A man who has riches without understanding is like the beasts that perish. This is God's word for us this morning. You may be seated once again. When we spend time in God's Word, and I trust that's something we're doing uh, on a regular basis, hopefully even on a, on a daily basis, but when we spend time in God's Word, um, more often than not, and more be, maybe I should say more than we might expect, God actually talks a lot about our stuff. God brings up our stuff and the role it has, or really maybe in light of Psalm 49, the influence our stuff has on our past and present and future. And so in doing this, um, now clearly Jesus is all about getting personal, but when he talks about our, our stuff, boy, it really feels like it gets pretty personal, doesn't it? I mean, all the stuff of this world, it impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of it is, is obviously very good. Some of it revolves around things like personal comfort, like our mode of transportation. Aren't you glad you didn't have to hitch up the horse this morning? Right? So it impacts like our mode of transportation. It impacts the clothes we wear. And, and a lot of it's very practical stuff. Some of it touches on maybe times of need. Who of us, I mean, really, who of us is not? We really should be grateful for medical technology, for the advancements of things such as antibiotics and medicine. These are stuff things, and, and we should be grateful for them. But when it comes to our stuff, even though much of it falls in the category of being essential, the reality is, and Psalm 49 teaches us about this, the impact our stuff has on our hearts can be a bit of a concern. Take a very practical thing for a moment. I mentioned clothing. Clothing, we'd say, is an essential. Well, and I mentioned here often enough, I thought I'd do a little Google search for a moment. 
and I found, I mean, I said, no, I just Googled in, expensive pair of jeans. That was a mistake. I don't remember the brand name because I didn't want to know it, really. But I came across a, a website that was selling a pair of jeans. Now, I grew up on a farm. I, you know, I mean, jeans were, jeans were what we worked in, right? If, if you got a $10, $10 pair of jeans, I, I guess I give my age away a little bit, $10 pair of jeans from uh, menswear or whatever. And, but no, there was a pair of jeans, and I kid you not, for $2,200. And that's just absurd, right? Now, I, I did dabble a bit more on this website, and, you know, they, they talk about how great you'll look in these jeans, and I'm, maybe so. I, I, you know, I wasn't particularly impressed by them, but I'm sure maybe they'd increase my social status among some people, but a pair of jeans is a pair of jeans. The problem is we give value, and that's where the psalmist is going to take us this morning. We tend to give too much value, and here where First Timothy comes in, where Paul reminds Timothy to say to the church, beware, tell them that the love of money. I mean, a pair of jeans is a pair of jeans, but the love we put into the objects around us, the stuff of our life, well, that, that's where things get troubling. So how do we navigate this? And trust me, I, and I know I'm, I'm speaking to the choir, we have to navigate this. We live in a world that's filled with stuff. And the impact of that stuff on our hearts or on our faith journey is something we need to talk about. And Psalm 49 helps that. And what I'm going to do this morning as we make our way through Psalm 49, I believe there's five, maybe six lessons. And on the back of the, of the bulletin, you see there's this nice open sheet, and you can write on there sermon notes, and you can write down these six lessons that the psalmist is teaching us this morning about our stuff. And here's the first lesson. We need wisdom. We need wisdom when it comes to how we handle our stuff. Not just you or those people over there, but as you see, if you have the psalm there and on the screen, he's talking to everybody. We don't know who the author is. It's a, it's a song of God's people, uh, director of the Sons of Carasso. But he's saying all, everybody, everybody needs wisdom when it comes to how we handle our, our stuff. And more so, when our hearts get overly invested, which, again, is where the problem. Now, we're going to look at this passage, but in beginning, as the psalmist does, calling us to this moment of, of, of wisdom, as we're going to see, uh, and I'll talk more about this, but when it comes to our stuff, we ought to live with a very loose grip on it. As the title of the sermon is, you, you can't take it with you. Who of us is going to argue with somebody like Job Job, who has just lost everything, and in Job 1, in this moment of incredible faith, I know he struggles, and we did a series on Job, and you find that when the rubber hits the road, his heart is hurting just so much in the midst of the pain. But his initial reaction is, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked will I depart. What a great philosophy about our stuff. Paul picks up on that. Later on, when he's writing to Timothy, he says, for we brought nothing into the world. And we can take nothing out of it. The psalmist begins this morning, and he's going to touch on a very significant topic. And here's the lesson. We need wisdom when it comes to this stuff. We need wisdom. Most people know, as Job did, as Paul did, we, can't, we cannot take it with us. But too often we live as if it's all we have and all that matters. Now, some of it is essential. I, I touched on that already, but we need wisdom because in the in-between, between what Job talks about, the beginning and the end, Paul, the beginning and the end, and Psalm 49 talks about we don't get to take it. Somewhere in the in-between, too often we live as if we do get to take it with us, as if it has ultimate value. It's important, but it's not meant to be ultimate. So how do we navigate that? The first lesson of Psalm 49, I encourage you to read it again this week as you make your way through it. We need wisdom. We need biblical wisdom. And the book of James chapter 1 verse 5 tells us if you lack wisdom, you should just ask for it and God will give it. And that's a wonderful promise this morning when it comes to this stuff. So there's, there's the first lesson. Now we're going to go into the passage a little deeper. Here's lesson number two, the foolishness of trusting in wealth. It's foolish to trust in wealth when it cannot save us. 
Now, it does a lot of good things, the things of our world, the stuff that we have. But the obvious point here in the opening next verses of Psalm 49 is that wealth, no matter how much or how little we have, and I'll I'll touch on that more in a minute, it cannot, says the psalmist, it cannot ransom us. It cannot redeem us. We're going to gather at the table this morning, the Lord's table, and this is where faith is. Jesus is the one who redeems us. Jesus is the one who can ransom us. But sometimes our sinful nature kicks in. And the psalmist is saying we approach the stuff of the world with the same kind of attitude, as if it can redeem us, as if it can ransom us. Now, it could be wealth, it could be success, it could be status, privilege, whatever. Whatever might be on this list. Not only can we not take it with us, clearly, the psalmist wants us to see, inspired by the Holy Spirit for God's people, that it cannot change your standing in God's sight either. It's foolish to trust in it. It's foolishness to think it can redeem you. And that alone, that alone should be enough to temper our love for it. But take a look at verse 7, because here's, here's the psalmist shouting the truth about it. No man can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for him. It doesn't matter if you have a dollar or a trillion of them. It's said that when Queen Elizabeth I Queen Elizabeth I was dying, she said these words, and and this is the queen. She said, all my possessions for one moment of time. But it doesn't work that way. We don't get to buy time. We don't get to redeem and ransom life. It's never worked that way. No one can do it. So there's lesson number two. It is foolish to trust in wealth when it cannot save us. Let's look at lesson number three, verses 10 through 12. Here's lesson number three. All the wealth in the world cannot extend life. Death is the great equalizer. That's a humbling thing to hear. But death is the great equalizer. It's also the great leveler because all people die. I mean, I, I, I don't say this flippantly, but it's, it's a fact, right? The mortality rate in our world is still at 100%, isn't it? 100%. Death is the great equalizer because it's inescapable. It's the great leveler. Everyone, I said this earlier with Job and Paul, everyone enters this world in the same way they leave it. You don't get a hitch of U-Haul behind a hearse. Everyone sees this, I think, too. And yet, and here's where we need the wisdom part, and all of these lessons intermingle, right? And yet, too often we live as, as if we can live forever. How many people and you can read about this, and God bless Google, right? How much money is invested every year in health things that extend life? And I'm not talking about medical intervention. I'm talking about beauty spas and, 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 and uh, tanning things. I mean, and some of it's, okay, I, I don't want to look like a pale fish in summer either, okay? But all the investment is ultimately because there's a certain love factor going on, and we should be cautious of that. Living in light of eternity. Death is the great equalizer. Look at verse 12. This is the summation of the psalmist about this lesson. But despite his riches, the rich man, and by rich mean here, the one who's living outside the kingdom principle of Jesus. It's not a sin to be rich. Please hear that. But the love of it is the sin, right? So the psalmist is saying, despite his riches, this is this lesson, death, uh, the rich man does not endure, he is like the beast that perish. And that's all of us, poor and rich alike. No matter what we gain here, it cannot extend your life. Humanity, says the psalmist, really, is, is the only living being. And again, I, I'm speaking generally, I don't, I don't know the mind of, of, of animals, but really, the humanity is the only living being who knows our life is going to end. We can live consciously of that fact, but judging, and this is where the wisdom of the Psalms coming in, by judging how foolishly sometimes we live or how the foolish live, which is those who lack a, a biblical worldview, recognizing where, what can ultimately save us, foolish live as if I can extend my life, that death, I'm somehow invincible. And that doesn't work. So there's lesson number three, Death's a great equalizer. Let that humble your own heart. 
Let it humble your own posture toward the effect and impact that the things of this world have on us. I want to pause here for a moment. I'll get back to the lessons, and I want to just give two quick comments about some lessons and learnings in, in about this. Because by now, even as I was writing the sermon, I'm getting a little prickly because I'm thinking, well, I've got, I mean, in the, in, the, in the eyes of much of the world, I'm pretty wealthy. I have a bed to sleep in. I had a fresh cup of water this morning. Took a shower, drove here in, in a car. Didn't have to hitch my horse up, right? Let's talk just briefly some general comments. And the first one is this. Two truths about trusting in wealth. It's not about the amount. For some, $500 is as hard for them to manage as $5 million might be for somebody else. It's not about the amount. Note, go back to the opening part of the psalm when it says rich and poor alike. All, all of us need wisdom. To trust in wealth, it doesn't matter how much we have. And the second thing I'd say is that it's worth noting that wealth or, or, or stuff can be both meaningless and meaningful. And this is what I mean by that. It can be meaningless if we expect it to give us what it cannot provide. It can't secure what is, what is functionally not able to do. And that's a problem of misplaced trust. I've referenced this earlier. Paul writes 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. He says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money, in other words, their trust is in it. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. See, that's where we have to see that the stuff can be meaningless but it also can be meaningful. It's the difference between foolishness and wisdom. Wealth, stuff, it can be meaningful. Because while we still have breath, and everybody here has it, while we still have breath, God invites us in Jesus Christ to invest it, to steward it, to shepherd it. Whether that means caring for those uh, who we love or, or neighbors, to, to share with those in need, or simply just being a really good steward of it so that God gets the glory. And it's not about self-promotion. That's where all of this stuff can be very meaningful. The difference is, do we have wisdom or not? Or are we foolish with the impact of the stuff on our hearts? This is a very big kingdom reality. Go to the New Testament, spend some time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even the Gospels, and Jesus has a lot to say, a lot to say about how this stuff can impact our hearts. Back to the lessons. Lesson number four. How do we live with understanding when it comes to our stuff? And here's lesson number four. Not all who are foolish have wealth. This kind of goes on what I was just saying a moment ago. The mere longing for wealth is folly enough. If you have your Bible open, you'll see it there also in verse 13. He's just talked about the fate of the wealthy who only love their money. But he says this, this is the fate of those who trust in themselves. All right, we've talked about that. And of their followers who approve their sayings. Here's the lesson. Not all who are foolish have wealth. The mere longing for it, right? Those who follow, right? And, and I think there's so much in our current culture which is contrary to the gospel in this regard in which uh, people think that if they can just set up, I mean, uh, a YouTube channel and that's going to be it for the rest of their life. I mean, I'm sure some of it is beneficial, but just being a follower of somebody who has wealth, in other words, the longing of my heart is to be not like Jesus, but to be like so-and-so, Bill Gates or anybody. And that itself is folly. And we have to be careful. The psalmist is really setting up a, a set of contrasts here, and this is the first one of them. Those who are rich... And, and live as fools. That's a warning. But those who long to be rich can also be fools. There's a way to be foolish. People who believe, if only if I were rich, if only if I were wealthy, if only, if only, if only, if only, then, oh, then I've arrived. And that's just not true. Look at verse 14 for a minute. If you have your Bible open, it says, like sheep, they now he's putting them all together, those who are living foolishly with wealth and those who are living longing for that. They are destined for the grave. Again, that's a great equalizer. If we're following, I mean, even if we're just 
following the wrong thing in life instead of ultimately Jesus and his kingdom and all the investment he calls us to, to love our neighbor and everything else, then it ultimately doesn't matter whether we have much or little treasures of this world instead of treasures in heaven, then we are foolish. We sang this song last Sunday. and In hindsight, maybe I wish I'd saved it for today, but the wonderful new hymn we've learned, My worth is not in what I own. That's the fact. That's the truth of the gospel in Jesus. So there's the fourth lesson. Let's look at the fifth one for a minute. It begins in the next section of verses because we're still talking a little bit about contrast here. And it begins with two very important words, but God. This is the difference, says the psalmist, if you have wisdom about your stuff between being a foolish person and having understanding, the understanding person recognizes God not my wealth, not my status, not the clothes I wear, not the car I drive. I'm sure not all bad things, but God is the one who redeems my life. God is the one who will surely take me to himself. I can't earn it, but he will give it. And there's the gospel of grace. We're going to gather at the table here in a few moments. Drink deeply, eat well of the great grace of God that is in this promise. God is the one who redeems those who trust Him, we're not going to be like those who trust in things and, and of the world because we know death is the equalizer. We can't take these things with us, but if our life is in Him through Jesus Christ, and He will redeem. That's the fact. And that's a promise to hold on to. The key, really, is that word redeem. Redeem, says the psalmist. Nothing we have Nothing we have will ever be enough to redeem the life of another, he said earlier in the verse. We cannot do, but God can. And I hope we'll just take hold of that promise again this morning. God has done it. Jesus paid the ransom we owed. Jesus is the one whom we could live forever. Through the grace and the cross of Jesus Christ, hear it again, we understand then, therefore, how we should also manage the stuff of this world how it's worthless, ultimately. As Paul would say later, compared to the surpassing glory of knowing Jesus Christ. And now we get to the sixth lesson, the final appeal in verses 16 through 20. Quite simply this, don't put your trust in what will not last. An author wrote a book, John Ortberg, in which the title was, It All Goes Back in the Box, right? When the game is over, it all goes back in the box. He told a story about how he would play um, Monopoly with his grandmother, and she, used, well, she was a ruthless player, and she would, she would smoke him every time. And he didn't quite comprehend all of this stuff. He was quite young, but eventually he remembers the moment when he got the concept where you would just, you, would, you give it all away, right? You know, no debt. Who cares about debt, right? The goal is to conquer the person next to you. If you play Monopoly, we play it in our house too. And he learned how to play the game. And he remembers the day he beat his grandmother at the game. And he thought he'd do a victory dance. And what does she do? Put it away and put it in the box because it's just a game. And when the game is over, it all goes in the box. The reality of the gospel calls us this morning to trust the one who owns all of it. All of it. And along the way, because we know we can't take it with us, our calling in Christ is to invest it in what he calls us to do. Our time, our energy, our talents, it's all part of the gifts he gives us. To invest it. Wise people do this. Wise people know that I'm not going to trust and will, and it will not last. I'm going to trust in, in Jesus. Wise people do this because we know this is, what it, this is what it means to belong to him. To be given immeasurably more than all I can ask or imagine and now to invest it. Because one of the great myths or, or illusions, not just of our day, but of all of history, is that we are in control of our eternity. Let's be aware why we need wisdom. Lesson number one, let's be aware of the grand illusion that the love of our stuff is more important than living in the light of Jesus. We can never be right with God apart from the one who gave his life as a ransom for us. 
So I close this morning with a prayer. This is a prayer I hope that uh, we can make our own. This prayer of understanding why wealth without understanding is dangerous. Let's go ahead and advance. Father, wealth without understanding is deadly. This is a prayer we can make. And then grant me an understanding heart so that, and I came across this phrase this past week and I love it, grant me an understanding heart so I trust you and use things and not use you and trust things. Let's make that our prayer. I believe Jesus is at the heart of something like this. Because whether we have much or little, stuff we have will never bring us joy, peace, and hope that we need so desperately. But God, in His amazing mercy, He can use our stuff to bless others and to, and to build His kingdom and to bless His church. And so let's be sure we're on the right path on this one. Let's be sure uh, we get this part right, that we pray for wisdom, that we have understanding so that we can see what God will do with all of our stuff. And let's trust Him. And then use things, not use God, and trust things. And that's the invitation. And again, it's one that calls us this morning to the table. Because we come not because we purchased a chair at this table. There is, the, the, the ground is level, right? At the cross, we say. Nobody purchases a place at the table. It's been purchased for you through Jesus' precious blood. And in Him, we have more than we could ever imagine. So may we now, therefore, come to the table and then go from here living the lessons of Psalm 49 this week, living wisely, with understanding when it comes to our stuff, to the joy of Christ in whom all blessings flow. Let's pray together. God in heaven, this stuff gets personal because it impacts us daily. Remind us again through the work of your Holy Spirit that you've called us to be good stewards, recognizing the true place of things in our lives. We're grateful for the blessings you do give us. Just help us to be good stewards with it, recognizing the power of your gospel that works in us and through us. And now as we come to the table here, we come rich and poor alike, young and old alike. We come because the ground is level at the cross to receive a grace which is enough for us in each day. Do a work amongst us, we pray, that we might live well for Christ in the days to come. We pray this in his name. Amen. In the Heidelberg Catechism, the question is asked, who are to come to the Lord's table? The answer given is this. Those who are displeased with themselves because of their sin, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their continuing weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ and therefore who also desire more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead a better life. People of God, here at the Lord's table, we celebrate the cleansing power of Christ's blood and forgiveness for us. Here we profess our faith in God's completed work, in who God is as our Father, in Jesus as our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit as our Comforter, in the ongoing work of leading us in the life of following Jesus. We rejoice this morning. We rejoice as we gather again here at the table because of what God promises to do. Just as he promised at our baptism, that we're not our own, that we belong to him, and that we've been bought with the precious blood of Christ. Here as we gather at the table, we remember, here we are renewed in this wonderful walk with Jesus because we are assured of what has been given us. And we are confident, as the catechism goes on to say, wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And so now following Jesus, we have a great opportunity today once again. Following Christ's command, we will take this bread and we will drink this cup, ordinary things of the world. And Christ will use them for extraordinary purposes as we follow him. 
as we come to the table this morning, let's begin our time in prayer together. Please join me. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks. In so many ways you have revealed yourself, both in ages past but in days recent. You have blessed us with signs of grace. We praise you that through the waters of the sea you led your people Israel out of bondage into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your Son, who was for us baptized in the waters of the Jordan, anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. And through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you've set us free from the bondage of sin and decay and death and given us cleansing and rebirth. And so we rejoice today because you have claimed us in our baptism and by your grace we've been born anew. And so we ask that you'll send your Holy Spirit once again so that this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Congregation of Jesus Christ, this is a joyful feast. Here we come, taste, and see God's grace toward us. This is the Savior's table. He invites those who trust Him to share the feast which He has prepared. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread and after giving thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As the bread is distributed this morning, we're going to sing together, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Thanks be to God. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. As the cup is distributed this morning, we'll sing how deep the Father's love for us. the blood of Christ, the cup of our salvation. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. God of grace, you renew us at your table with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Having been strengthened in faith here again, strengthen us in love. Help us to live and work to the glory and praise of your name. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand for God's blessing.
stuff of this world has an insidious way of making its way into our hearts. Psalm 49 calls us to be very wise, wise in the way of Christ and recognizing that he's the one who redeems, he is the one who ransoms. And so in the sure and certain fact of Christ and his cross, we go from this place once again, trusting that God will help us to be better stewards, better caretakers of the things he gives us, that he might receive the glory and receive now also his blessing as you go from this place. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. And together God's people say, Amen. Amen.